My name is Ali. I'm a doctor and YouTuber. I'm Taymor. I'm a data scientist and writer. And you're listening to Not Overthinking, the weekly podcast where we think about happiness, creativity, and the human condition. Hello, and welcome back to Not Overthinking. Taymor, how are you doing today? I'm doing pretty well, mate. I'm, uh, I'm a bit tired. I've had a, yet another week of not sleeping enough, um, but I've had a good day. How about you? I've had a great day. Um, I'm actually a, sort of in the, in the middle of VidCon London, Whoa. which is like this big YouTubing convention. Well, it's more like a convention for like online video, but basically it's like YouTube. Although they had a TikTok booth there today. And there were a few like four-year-olds roaming around and doing dances and things. <laughs> that was quite funny. But today is very exciting. Why is it exciting, Tamil? Because we're sponsored. By- well, I was about to say <laughs> Oh, <that's> no. Oh, <laughs> uh, no. Even more exciting. Exciting than, uh, than sponsorships. Here we're joined by a very special guest. We're joined by Callum. Hi guys, Callum. Can you introduce yourself uh, to the to the pod? Hi everyone. I'm Callum. I uh, I was lucky enough to be Ali's flatmate for six years at Cambridge. I'm a doctor too, and I'm down for an interview. And these guys are putting me up. Yes. So we're all at uh, at my my new flat in London. Uh, we're having a little sleepover, and we thought we'd record a podcast. So I think Callum, I think Callum is an, is actually a phenomenal guest for this thing because Callum has actually listened to the podcast since. The the first episode no he way listens, ev- listens every week yeah yeah yeah. every single week yeah yeah, yeah. wow that's incredible 100 percent fun and um and you you even actually give us feedback like probably my favorite no i know we're behind on emails um sorry to everyone whose emails we haven't replied to we will get around to them callum is actually one of the people who does send us emails uh, i'm not sure if we i'm sure we've replied to you you've replied to like a couple of them right <laughs> uh, <laughs> but not all 28 <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so I, th- I think Callum has would have an interesting perspective on all of this because he, you know, we all know each other in real life. You know, he, he knows both of us in real life, and he also has listened to the podcast uh, in its entirety. And so I thought it'd be really interesting, Callum, to get your sort of a just like general thoughts on the podcast and general kind of trends you've seen. Uh, basically, I think you'd have an interesting vantage point on the podcast, and I think you you know both of us, so you'll be able to like kind of roast, kind of like keep it real, and like you know crit- critique the podcast. Yeah, and please don't worry about hurting any of our feelings because it's. It's good content at the end of the day, isn't it? <laughs> hey, and you guys will like it too. Absolutely. <laughs> so what, are you like, Are you a year old now? You must be a year old. I think we started in like April last year. So we're mm. approaching a year old. So I remember, because I was away, I was abroad about this time last year. And it was then, it was that, that you sent me your little trial like as I was going I listened to it on my way to the airport and it was about a year ago now so, yeah, yeah, so this, this must be like this project it's must very, be a year old it's very close I think this episode is like our 40 this will be like 43 or something like that I think we started recording them around this time last year when we were in France which was like mid-February late February or something mm. little family holiday so yeah it's it's really probably about a year now and how do you think you've come on this time how do I think I've come along well you guys the podcast how do you, how, how's it different now to what you were doing at the start I feel like at the start we probably had better topics <laughs> whereas as in so uh, when we when we when we decided to do the podcast uh Tengmore was very confident that he'd easily be able to come up with a topic every single week i was very skeptical about this because you know being a uh, a famous youtuber for the last two years i I'd, I'd sort of recognized firsthand the difficulty of actually coming up with ideas for content but Tame was fairly convinced that this was this was going to be fine so i think for the first few weeks while we were exhausting Tengmore's kind of uh, pre pre-existing list of content uh it felt very easy we were like, oh, we can easily do this every week. And then we started hitting that that wall a few weeks into it. We were like, oh, crap. You know, it's, it's actually kind of hard thinking about what you can talk about on a podcast. But I feel like in the last few weeks, at, le- at least from my end, I found that we can pretty much just pick anything and it will just turn into a conversation. And if people want to listen to that conversation, that's great. And if not, then that's fine. And I've stopped really kind of caring about the topic selection so much. I don't know if that's really come across, but I wonder what your thoughts are about this. Yeah, I think I think I care a lot less as well. Before it used to like, you know, I used to be very concerned about like, oh my God, we haven't got a topic, what's going to happen? I think you could do with caring a bit more because the only reason it works out in the end is because I pull both of our weight and, you know, we actually end up having a reasonable conversation. I don't know. I've I've, I've, I've got about 50 books that we can have discussions about. I've, I've been actively collecting tweet storms we can have discussions about. It's just that every week I'm like, well, we could do a tweet storm about this. You say, oh, actually, no, I've got a topic instead so boys think- boys boys you got me along to do the roasting <laughs> like come on, down, come on. <laughs> right Callum, please can you moderate this <laughs> this session so i so i i i've been listening to the pod for a year right and i i started commuting to work in august when i changed jobs so i went from cycling to having a car journey and i you you've you're on the list of the podcasts that populate my week and wow. i found myself listening to it a bit differently because i used to i used to listen to it just like in the living room when i would sit down and 
full time. You used to listen to it. I, I, yeah, well, oh no, I, I would. I would have it. You know, I, I'd I'd have an evening where right, I'm going to listen to the pod now. Yeah, and I'd put it on in the background, and I'd be doing some other stuff, but mostly just listening to the pod. Oh wow! And the thing about doing it in the living room is when I got to, you know, if I if I got that feeling that you guys were just chatting breeze, yeah, then I'd then I'd stop and I'd think about it and I'd write down exactly why you were chatting breeze. Mm. But now that I'm in the car, all I end up doing is just like shouting back at the radio, being like, <laughs> "No, come on, that's that's garbage. I'm not going to stand for that." Motivation and, and then, is a myth. Is a myth. <laughs> But the trouble is, by the time I get to work, I've then got like five minutes in the car to try and distill all of that down into one angry email and send it. So there's a few like unwritten ones in here or like half written ones that actually don't make sense now that I haven't finished them. But clearly there was stream of consciousness at the time that wanted to come and I had views. That's really interesting. I'm sure there must be, I'm sure there must be like a way around. There must be a way to like record thoughts and things. Yeah, so if I listen to a podcast, I kind of dictate stuff into my Apple Watch, but I, I've, I've stopped listening to podcasts in the car for that exact reason, that it's a lot harder to actually kind of coordinate thoughts and get them into a reasonable format. I could, I could, I could sort of dictate if I had some way to actually dictate. I just don't have your fancy tech. This, I lose watches too often, so this thing's like a tenor. No, fair is. So what's some of the stuff that you've sort of started drafting angry emails to us about the pod that you have not yet aired your opinions on? I mean, we can we can we can start with things that you have sort of aired your opinions on because I guess most people won't have heard these opinions yet. I suppose so. So the the, the first thing the first thing I, I came and I suppose this is this is like, this is big this is big um, this is a big beast, right? Because you've come back to this over and over again. It was episode four it started with, right? Ah. But but this motivation is a myth thing is a myth. Okay, Ooh. you heard it here first. <laughs> Hot take. <laughs> motivation is in fact not a myth. Motivation is a myth is a myth. <laughs> okay, why is motivation is a myth a myth? So the the the. The thought that I, what immediately came to mind when I first heard this was, it's it's all very well taking that word out of your vocabulary, but the, the word describes a feeling, right? The, the, we, we only use that word because because it describes a concept that we all experience. Okay, okay hang on. So I'm, I'm just going to summarize my, my thoughts on this so, uh, for people who have, have, haven't listened. Give us motivation as a myth, and then I'll tell you why it's... <laughs> so um, my theory, which I've stolen off the internet, is that motivation is a myth because motivation is just that feeling of is 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 that phenomenon where we f- where we need to feel like doing something before we do the thing whereas the argument goes that we should scrub the word motivation from our vocabulary and replace it instead with the word discipline because discipline is how we actually get stuff done motivation is a very unreliable thing to rely on if we are, if we want to do anything that is you know painful in the short term but useful in the long term and that that's why you know this turns into a nice sound bite motivation is a myth so that's sort of the again sort of the broad overview of that line of line of reasoning but you disagree with this so i reckon if you if you can do that if if you're capable of manipulating your mind to just deleting the concept of motivation from it then that works really well but if you if you don't have the the ability to manipulate your mind like that i don't think it's helpful because it describes a feeling that you that you need to overcome to actually you know there is some inertia to all this work right and whether you call it discipline that gets you over it or motivation that gets you over it that's still a that, that's still a thing and and i don't i think to just delete it when you don't have the ability to do that mental gymnastics doesn't help take i took for example at the time um the the whole idea of so at cambridge we called it the uh, the week five blues this idea that about like just over halfway through term you got you know, the, the, everybody said oh it's week five and why is week five bad i don't know everybody just like felt a bit bad around week five and 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 Kusu did this campaign where they said the, that's the students' union at, at Cambridge did this campaign where they said ban week five. Week five isn't a thing. Uh, you don't feel any worse then. You feel you feel like that all the time. You should just look after yourself throughout the whole term, not just in week five. Week five isn't special. Don't do anything then. And, and that's fine. Like we should all look after ourselves more often. But 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 week five blues is a thing, right? B- because we had something similar at school. We called it the November dip, oh. and and it kind of described the same phenomenon where you're a little over halfway into term you've we, we all hit the start of term slightly too hard in terms of just spreading ourselves a bit too thin, going out a bit too much, working a bit too hard, taking on too many things, not doing quite enough work, doing a bit too much sport. 
And then about halfway through term, the nights get long, the clocks go, uh, the clocks go back, everything gets darker, it's colder, it's miserable, and the work's piling up, and you've got exams to do, and the end of term's coming, and actually everything's catching up with you a little bit. So there is a reason why around that kind of just after halfway point through term, it gets a bit stressful, right? That's a thing. Yeah. So deleting the week five blues from your mind is fine, and maybe you'll feel a bit better for having done that, but the thing is still there, mm, right? Okay. So take this back to the motivation as a myth thing. If you can get motivation out of your vocab- vocabulary and just say discipline, so I, I suppose people say like, just do it. Yeah, exactly. That would be the... Just do yeah. if, if you could just do it, then just do it. But, but I don't think ignoring the fact that you need some motivation to overcome this inertia to do something helps if you're not in that headspace. Okay. I completely agree with that. Um, and I think, I, I think possibly the point that I didn't, I didn't make clear enough in, in, in the episode then was that my, my theory on this is that in an ideal world, motivation would be a myth. And like the gold standard would be that we scrub the word motivation from our vocabulary. Um, and now let's take that as the gold standard and let's park it to the side because, you know, that's like the sort of enlightenment that, that very few of us, if any of us, can actually attain. But I think it's useful to have as sort of like our guiding, our North Star. And so at that point, it becomes a case of, okay, so in, in an ideal world, motivation would be a myth. But in real life, practically speaking, it, it, it is a thing. Therefore, what are the things we can do to increase our motivation to do stuff? And that was when I think we discussed things like making the activity more pleasurable or making the alternative more painful or all sorts of other hacks for increasing our motivation, increasing the activation energy, or whatever you want to call it. That. Yeah, and the other thing is, I often wonder the extent to which you, you need the motivation for the, for the things that you think you need to, right? So I often I when I was back in school, right? I was I was I was really good at maths, right? Oh, check Ooh. you out. <laughs> and I know you guys were, and I know you guys were too. Right? I was pretty good at maths as well. So, Tim actually did maths at university, so he must have been pretty good at maths. But but did you ever did you ever feel like a need to study the math? You know, like I ought to do some maths. No, I, I, I should I should be motivated to do. It. We, you know, you guys you guys were you guys okay, right? We're going to boast now. You guys were straight A students, right? Straight A star students, mate. Come on. I knew you'd say that. Straight A star students. N- 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 none, of the exa- none of the exams you ever did touched the sides, did they? I got I got an A. In classical civilizations, was it? That's right. I found A little biology quite hard. I'm not going to lie. I only got 92% of that. Didn't realise this would be quite such a sore topic. Sorry, lads. <laughs> <laughs> oh, mate. So, just kind of on this note, I used to be super, super arrogant about my math, my, my, my math ability to the point where I'd be kind of practicing magic tricks and card tricks and stuff in math, in math lessons. And that was fine in like core core one and core two for AS. And as soon as we got to A2, so year 13 in the UK, so that's kind of core three and core four. Suddenly it was like, oh crap, I actually need to do like figure out how this stuff works. Because we did a mock where I didn't revise and I ended up getting like 60, 63% or something. And my math teacher kind of called up my mum at work and being like, you know, I'm really concerned about Ali. He's like, you know, his performance is dipped. He doesn't care in class. He's, he's, he should have disrespect. <laughs> so then at that point, I had to actually start working for maths. But I don't think that was that was the point you were making. No, my point was, it, it, think about why you, think about why you're feeling the the need to get motivated because I, I think and I might be wrong with this but there must be some level where lack of motivation isn't just you not wanting to do it there is a sort of some deep part of your brain going you actually don't need to do this you, you you'll you probably manage this with what you've already got mm. do something else you're actually wasting your time with this what if your brain's talking to you like that yeah is that the same thing as uh, like the the alternative is not painful enough like for example, I didn't have much motivation at all to study for my final year uh, written medical exams because I knew that actually I was out of the running to get a distinction, and I was pretty sure that I was going to pass. And it felt that any any extra effort was just not that useful. And I was like, I really d- d- don't need to do this. That's exactly what I mean. Okay, so so I suppose if we're trying to hack motivation, then the answer is to uh, is like firstly like really ask ourselves like, do we actually need to be doing this thing? And if the answer to that is yes, then we're like, okay, right, <laughs> why do I need to be doing this? What, what, what are the alternatives? Alternatives. What if I fail at this thing, and will it actually make a difference to my life? Yeah, I think there's a there's an interesting sort of uh, contrarian school of thought when it comes to productivity stuff that is starting to take hold uh, in certain online circles um, of sort of uh, cool, cool bloggers that I follow, like Venkatesh Rao, who I mention on here fairly often. Uh, which is very like I, I think the general narratives in society are that that like there are all these things that you should be doing, and if you're not doing them, you should feel guilty and you're a bad person, kind. 
kind of thing. Um, and this is like, this comes up time and time again in my conversations with people. I remember I was talking to someone and I, we were talking about like, oh, like, what do you listen to when you're at the gym or something? Or like when you're commuting or something like that. Uh, and they said, they said something like, oh, I listen, I listen to music, but I know I should listen to podcasts or audiobooks or something. <laughs> and that was, that. I think that just really summed up like a lot of, a lot of the stupid pressure that everyone faces nowadays of like, here are all the things that you need, that you should be doing. Otherwise you suck. Um, and I think everyone, I think almost the default state in, mo in a lot of areas of our lives is that like, oh, I should be doing X, but I'm actually not doing X. Uh, and, and that's kind of where the whole, I think the motivation thing is kind of speaking to that because, uh, you know, you don't even really think about whether you're, mo you know, your motivation, if you are not motivated to do something, but you feel like you should do the thing anyway. Like, you know, if you're hanging out with your mates or whatever it, the thought never crosses your mind of like hmm i'm really am i motivated to do that like it, it's irrelevant it's, it's only when you feel like you should be doing something and you're not doing it that you start to think about this stuff and i think there are i think society's got currently like way off the edge about like the things that we feel like we should be doing all the time and so I mean, my interpretation of what you were saying, Callum, was not this like medical school thing of, uh, you know, discrete levels and there's no point like b being in middle grounds between things. I thought the point you were making was that actually we can chill out. Like if you really don't, yeah, if you don't really don't have the motivation to do a certain thing, maybe there's an alternative world in which it's okay for you to just not do that thing. And there are alternative ways for you to live your life or achieve the same goals. So what if, what if we think about this differently, right? We, you know, we used to spend our whole lives together, right? And now we live at opposite ends ends of the country and don't see a great deal of each other. Have you ever thought that about being motivated to see more of your mates? Um, motivation isn't the word I use in that in in those contexts. The the framing in my mind is simply that I uh, sort of, I, I feel like I cannot make the time to do it. But really, that's a myth. It's more like that I don't want to make the time to do it because I, there are other priorities in my life. So, for example, um, one of the thoughts that I have is come August when I'll be completely free and un unshackled from the full time job. Uh, I would love to just kind of do a road trip up the country to ultimately and land in Scotland and just kind of visit friends along the way and that would just be a really fun thing to do and I could kind of you know do writing in various coffee shops and stuff along the way and it would it would be a really enjoyable way to spend the time but I feel like I can't do that right now because of all the ver all the other sort of competing priorities that are higher than kind of drive eight hours to go to Edinburgh to see Callum. But but we never talk about motivation to go and see friends. Like even even the friends I, I can't I you know even not the folk that live in London, but there are folk who live in Ed, so I live in Glasgow. There are folk who live in Edinburgh who I have said three times to we should do something. How many folk around London have you said oh, we gosh. should do something sometime? You live like in the same city and dude, dude, I've got you. the craziest example. One of our friends lives on this floor. He 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 runs the company that manages this flat that we're living in right now, and we have not seen him since moving in a month ago. He lives on this floor we have a whatsapp group we regularly say like <laughs> let's do dinner this week whatever we have not seen the guy <laughs> So, so what is motivation? I feel like the reason we don't use the word motivation for those sorts of things is because in my experience, we only apply motivation to the stuff that is short term, not pleasurable, that we think will have long term benefit. For example, I would never say, oh, I need the motivation to go play squash because I absolutely love playing squash. But I would say I need the motivation to go to the gym because gym is kind of that short term. Uh, it's, it's, it's not very nice, even though I know it's beneficial in the, in the long term. And I can't think of a single example of motivation that doesn't fall into that category of sort of short term and kind of sh short term loss for long term gain, which isn't quite the framing for when it comes to kind of sh hanging out with friends. Even though, as Tim was saying earlier, actually, in the, it, it, you know, in the long term, we should we should be doing more of it. And, and clearly we're putting it off for some reason. What's the short term loss that stops you from going and like knocking next door? I feel like it's 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 com it's com a competing priorities and b a an overvaluing of the short of of short term gains. So for example, I know that short term gains are I need to get a, a video out by ne by next Tuesday. Long uh, long term gain is I could in fact you know given that I've got Monday off I could fly to Scotland and say hi to Callum and kind of spend spend the day with him and that would be good for our relationship over the next kind of fifty years. But actually, it's the short term priority of I need to get the sponsored <laughs> video out, which is currently taking up all my brain space. And I feel like this is one of the common heuristics that we as as humans kind of go through in that we really overweight the short-term consequences of stuff and we overlook the long-term consequences or the long-term benefits and so perhaps like yeah if, if it feels to me like the idea of motivation is sort of similar to that where we are overweighting the short-term pain and not valuing the long-term gain enough so where do you think this leaves motivation i i hate look i hate to defend ali but i think uh <laughs> 
I think part of all this like advice stuff is that it is actually helpful to have, you know, phrases or sound bites that you can recall in your head and when it's crunch time. And so regardless of like whether this phrase motivation is a myth is actually airtight as a concept or whatever, it's still kind of useful when you, you know, when you want to go to the gym, when you feel like you should go to the gym, you're feeling kind of lazy and maybe in your head you think, oh, I didn't really feel motivated to go to the gym. Then, you know, you can recall the sound bite of like motivation is a myth and that might actually get you to get up off your ass and go to the gym even though like you know philosophically it might not be sound maybe i'm just biased because actually the 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 way i learned this first wasn't that motivation is a myth it was when someone first said to me just fucking do it oh really okay yeah i guess it's it's the same it's basically the same concept at least it's a more pretentious way of uh of saying it and crucially it doesn't have to come with a sound effect on the pod (laughs) oh yeah yeah Yeah, no it's too much effort to edit that out so it's gonna stay in <laughs> okay so I, f- I feel like that covers motivation what the, the, the there were a few other things that i think you wanted to you wanted to bring up we have touched on that there i wondered about um oh, no. right i tell you what the the back of the I, think, I can't remember exactly which one it was 18 springs to mind but at the start of podcast 18 uh tim goes off on one about uh about this excel conference he was at oh yeah do you remember that a spreadsheet risk was it or you sprig the EU Spreadsheet Risk Interest Group Conference. Wow. <laughs> Rolls off the tongue. Yeah. <laughs> I probably made it sound sexier than it was. <laughs> yeah. You yeah. I managed it. Um, so so while I was listening to that, I, I, you know, obviously, like, you keep your spreadsheets to yourself. But I wondered... <laughs> I wondered, I kind of thought, because at the same time, I, I was thinking like, this is, that's too niche. I've literally never met anybody who has spoken about spreadsheets like that. Um, but my mind does the same. My mind like it ends up down these rabbit holes, as I'm sure you've all uh, it, it had as well. So it made me think at the time, what are these like random niches that you, what's the most recent random niche you've gone down that if you had like loads of time, you would have no problem studying to the ends of the earth and would actually want to want to like find know everything about so i've got a really easy one um so there's uh through uh, the fact that i was coming to this kind of vid uh, vidcon and i knew i was going to be meeting other youtubers who are part of this agency that i uh, that, that i'm part of as well um and one of these guys is a guy called sam and he runs a youtube channel called wendover productions which has got like two and a half million subscribers that's fantastic i watch it all the time oh no way yeah, yeah it's like right up your street and i only recently discovered this channel like literally three weeks ago and it was a video about airplanes or something and then like every single day i've watched like five of his videos while sitting on the toilet it's been sped up at double speed and they're all things like you know uh, how airline pricing works and you know why some airlines fly to certain places and it's just such interesting stuff and i feel like i would really be into planes if i had had more time to really kind of drill drill down into it so actually just i was staying before i stayed here with you guys on thursday night i stayed with another mate just uh, south of the river and he lives he lives kind of almost under the heathrow flight path but actually from his balcony you can see not only the planes coming into Heathrow uh, east to west but you can also in the distance see Gatwick planes taking off and if you just he's just got the view between two skyscrapers that you can see planes taking off steep from London City and and if you so I did I did end up with this one off the back of a Wendover yeah. binge <laughs> on his planes thing. Uh, are you sure he's not sponsoring you for this part? Never mind. Um, <laughs> on the back of a Wendover binge on these planes thing, I I looked up like how they route planes into London, and it's all it's all it's public. It's on like the um, the International Air Transport Association website because all these charts are public, right? That's how pilots know how they're supposed to come in. And of course, London's this the sky's quite big. There's loads of space, but you've still got like planes coming into five different airports mm. all in one place, and they've got this clever like these they, essentially roads in the sky that these the planes follow. And actually, since I knew that, I could as I was looking at the planes, I could see these up there, mm. and that was fa- that was fascinating. That was fascinating. That was like I got far too into that for like something that I will never use ever in in, in knowledge. So two points I want to I want to make here off the back of that. So firstly, I feel like you should pitch this as an idea to Wendover Productions because that would be. A really 
really interesting video. And I was chatting to him, like, you know, because we were playing an escape game earlier today and we were, we were talking about how he comes up with ideas and he was saying that, yeah, he'd love to have a kind of other people generate content. So it might be worth doing. Secondly, um, we did a, a, a random episode of a podcast called Episode Party mm. um, with these two guys who are in, also in the UK. And one of, uh, it was, it's a, basically a format where me and Tame and these two other guys, uh, we each listened to one episode of a podcast that we recommended to each other and we discussed it. Um, and one of the podcasts that they recommended was about uh, the, uh, this, the like the peregrine falcon or yeah 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 something the like guy who'd followed followed a single peregrine falcon around for like twelve years or something yeah like very odd thing to do um, but one of the things that uh, were one of the insights that came from that was that once you for example get into something like listening out for the cries of birds at that point suddenly you've unlocked that aspect of like the world and suddenly you can hear the cries of birds everywhere and you can like it it just makes sense and so that was what I was thinking when you talked about this Heath- Heathrow flight thing that once you know it's there you used to suddenly start seeing it and it feels like sort of you've unlocked a different dimension almost in your mind yeah yeah yeah. no it definitely it definitely felt like that because uh, because otherwise they're just otherwise they're just there right the planes just happen but but this is this magic dance in the sky that if you if you know the moves to it then you feel i don't know i feel like part of the club <laughs> <laughs> yeah so my thing is actually kind of similar to that it's it's sort of uh it's london transport and specifically like the trains and tubes um <laughs> <laughs> wow boy that's like a boys, theme here <laughs> Yeah, I just uh, think it's like so fascinating. Like every time I go to Covent Garden, I go to the London Transport. I think I've, tr- I've tried dragging you to the London Transport Museum once. I was, I, think we, I can't remember who we were with. I was like, guys, let's just like, let's just like read some books in here for a bit or something. And everyone's like, no, why are we in the London Transport Museum? Um, and it's absolutely fascinating stuff. The other day, last week, I found uh, a PDF, a 300 page PDF by Transport for London. Transport for London, amazing organization, by the way. Like the level of thinking and detail that goes into this is, is unbelievable. 300 page PDF about like essentially as a style guide for every single sort of uh, train and tube station in London. They have like they they have like a classification of like the visual styles of different stations. They like you know the, the level of detail they go into is like ridiculous to make sure that this is like a, a, a good user experience. For well, what do you mean for for example? Oh no, uh, if you're on the Northern Line, the signs have to look a little bit dingy. Or how, <laughs> how does it work? Um, so I didn't go too deep into it, but for example, um, they have they have a they have two sort of main mo- look this is not going to be interesting. <laughs> Uh, they have like two they have like the circle motif um basically the, the the tfl the london underground logo is like a circle with a line through it kind of thing uh and the circle motif is meant to represent sort of touch points between like uh the 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 pass- the, the user and like tfl or whatever and so you'll notice that like anytime there's a thing where you need to interact with uh with the system in some way there will be the the circle motif there no um you're kidding dude uh, th- 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 this just scratches the surface like and and this star guys goes into detail about like you know the best the best sort of approach to actually you know what kind of building materials to use for stations as well it has like guidelines and like you know if possible use like modular systems of things because it's, it's like easier to fix and stuff like this and like it goes into like the really the nitty gritty of like essentially how, how stations should be designed and again this is just one PDF I, I think like the history of the London Underground is like amazing and I want to look more into it um, yeah I just absolutely love it and uh, yeah I think I think everyone in London should actually learn about it because it would just make the experience of living here much more meaningful. Then you're kind of when you're on the tube, sort of kind of sweaty uh, with all those other people on the central line or whatever. It'll just be a more meaningful experience because you'll kind of understand the the rich history and and sort of thoughts that went into all of it. Cool. Okay. Kind of one thing in particular that I wanted to get your thoughts on is kind of like knowing knowing both of us in real life. Is it is it different when we're on the podcast than in real life? And like, what's that? What's the experience like of hearing your mates on a podcast? Because because actually, one of my friends hates it. He think kind of for the uh, similar reason as your car thing of like it's weird like listening in on this conversation with your mates that you're not allowed to participate in, <laughs> <laughs> and then they say stupid stuff that annoys you and you can't do anything about it. Yeah, there's there's sometimes. There's sometimes when I wish that you'd call each other out a bit more. Okay. Do you think it's a bit too like uh, circle jerky? So this was sometimes when you 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 both when you both agree on what you're talking about, you sometimes don't push each other. R- rather, you just say your piece, and then the other person says their piece, and then the other person says their piece, and then the other way. And actually, you just reinforce gradually as you go along the things that you're saying. Oh, okay. Whereas I'm sitting there being like, but why though? 
and wishing that one of you would ask the yeah, other. Yeah, yeah, Because actually when you do, there are some pods, podcasts that you do that where where you, one of you clearly doesn't buy what the other's saying. Mm. And then when you take each other on, you actually get far deeper into the discussion yeah. than you did before. Those are the only times that I resent not actually being here <laughs> to bang your heads together and be like, no, come on, explain yourselves. Oh, that's interesting. I've never quite thought of that before because I feel like it's when we're disagreeing with something it's usually you've come up with some kind of novel insight and i feel like i'm uh, sort of being being the naysayer and saying that mm. actually tamor like i don't think that analogy works in all cases as you're saying it, <laughs> it probably does mm. and i feel a little bit bad for doing that because i'm like well you know tamor's the one in the arena he's the one coming up with the original content i'm just here pulling it down but it sounds like what you're saying is that that's actually potentially valuable stuff i think it is because then you then you 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 learn more you learn more about the about the subject yeah i totally agree i think it's really bad that we do that we have had a, a, quite a few kind of potential topics recently where we've thought oh sh- should we do an episode on x like you know i think there was, the, there was one we were, we were thinking of doing about sh- sh- should we do an episode about complaining and whether it's ever okay to complain about stuff dude we've done an episode on that oh, fine uh, but uh, there was a lot of umming and ahhing before that because we thought that tame and i had pretty pretty similar views on the idea of complaining i uh, basically that a blanket ban on complaining at all times um and we felt that it would be useful to have a third opinion opinion on this front to actually argue to actually make the case for complaining otherwise it would end up being far too circle jokey i'm not sure how that pod- podcast ended up being i feel like we, we tried to be a bit more nuanced with it but equally we've had a few more recently where we thought no we'll we'll park that until we can get a third person who actually has meaningful you just views kinda, well no but that's so let's go into that right so that whole that 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 episode you ended up like with this fence sitting neutral dispassionate analysis wasn't it oh, that was so it. stupid that was terrible yeah <laughs> So Tame thought that the the NDA acronym was terrible. What did you think of it? I I haven't really thought about it since. Yeah, but. like nobody does that though. It, it, it just ended up being so idealistic. Okay. It, it, yeah. In terms of, um, it, you know, in, in how you got there. Okay. So okay, uh, you, you don't. Can you we don't give some context for people who haven't listened to episode whatever it was? Yeah, go for it. Sure. sure. So essentially, this, this episode came off the back of a uh, Ed Sheeran concert that we went to. Uh, there were four of us. We drove up to Leeds, uh, four hours each way or something like that. Stood out in the cold and rain listening to an Ed Sheeran concert. Uh, and essentially, we all thought it was kind of average. Average or like, eh, kind of not worth it or whatever. But not, well, I I was bold enough to say it, but no one else wanted to be the person that said, actually, guys, that was, that was kind of rubbish, wasn't it? Um, and so that kind of got us thinking of like, hmm, you know, why did no one bring that up, even though we were all thinking it uh, and that kind of stuff? And we we're kind of, yeah, trying to figure out like, is it good or bad to come out of something like that and then say, oh, actually, I, I didn't enjoy that or something. Um, and sort of on the NDA front. Yeah, and then we kind of, uh, we kind of reached the conclusion that when, uh, essentially, I think we said something along the lines of complaining is bad, um, b- complaining kind of dampens the vibe unless it is understood by all parties involved that the complaining is uh, not actually complaining and is just neutral dispassionate analysis. So for example, the Ed Sheeran thing, you know, I didn't really go for Ed Sheeran. I went for a road trip with the boys. And so even if I came out saying, Ed Sheeran, you know, that concert sucked, like deep down, I-, I wouldn't have really enjoyed the, you know, the experience any more or less because I wasn't really there for the concert. So I'd just be making a neutral dispassionate uh, comment on the on the thing. And so in that case, like it shouldn't be seen as a bad thing. Yeah, I don't think complaining is a, is a bad thing. Although uh, you know, those who know me well will um, w- will spot some hypocrisy here, because I I don't like complaining for the sake of complaining, even though I appreciate that's a thing that people do. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know what I mean? You, know, yes. you, you must you must have you must have moaned about work. It's cathartic. Point. It is nice and yeah, in, in small doses. But every time I do, I I, I have this sort of um, like, oh, it's like spider sense. No, it's not spider sense. It's just like s- s- some kind of it, it feels like there's there's a voice in the back of your head. Yeah, going. being like this is bad. This is not good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the, the the whole like I I don't I, I don't like moaning about things that you can't change. Mm, yeah. I don't think there's any I don't think there's any point to it, even though it's cathartic. Yeah. Um, but I don't know how that sits along the 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 whole sort of neutral dispassionate analysis thing because you can you know it, it doesn't it doesn't make any difference really whether you just sort of you know as you said it didn't matter to you whether the Ed Sheeran was any good or bad so why um, do we need to find a why do we need to finalize a position on whether we thought Ed Sheeran was good or bad or indifferent yeah actually I think we also mentioned this in the episode about like why do we feel the need to like yeah, you know, quantify something or assign a value or a rating to something you know why can't you just like experience something and, that, and that's it yeah. <laughs> like not compare it to other things you've experienced how was that holiday or how was that film yeah it was good <laughs> it was a film yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we went abroad <laughs> 
Yeah, I feel like I've I've actually started doing this more recently. Like, yes. I get annoyed when people ask me to rate experiences. Oh my god, so much! I, yeah. It really grinds my gears. Yeah, <laughs> I, I I think like especially when Mimi asks me, oh, you know, how was how how was the meal or something like that? You yeah, know, as, yeah. As if I want to make some kind of kind of judgment statement on the food. And like, I'm like yeah, it was, yeah, it was, yeah, it was good. It's, it's food. <laughs> food is food. Um, I don't know. Surely, though, people are after because I, actually, I disagree. I've I've tried to um, be a bit more eloquent about the experiences that I've had recently. So my mum, my mum's been texting me while I've been down here, and I've been doing all the like I've been I've been being an educated tourist while I've been here taking these these days. So I've been to like the Changing of the Guard and the Tutankhamun exhibition, and I've been to the British Museum, and I didn't go to the Natural History Museum because it queued out the door because it's half term and that sucked. But anyway, um, and 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 so. My was like what was the what was the Tutankhamun exhibition like and I could have said yeah it was good because that would yeah. be an accurate representation of it but I said something like what did I what did I say I said it you know it was it was really impressive and I was talking about the sort of detail that things were in mm. and, and things that really impressed me because because actually it, either she's asking for my benefit or she's asking for hers yeah. right and, you know so maybe she's asking because she just wants to be polite but she, she you know and she's my mum she might just be asking to make conversation and to I think that's almost and, always the case. And we yeah. don't and we don't talk to our mums enough and sorry mum and Mimi. <laughs> a bid theory. But she but, was, she was but, making a bid and you were replying to that bid. But in kind. If somebody else is asking because they're actually interested, then yeah. then we should do them the courtesy of telling them what we actually thought about it. Hello, expound. Because we're not I, I don't think any I don't think any of us are good are are good at actually expanding in that way in two sentences. Give me two sentences about what impressed you most about no, the exhibition no, no, no. and what but the, the, you most. the point no no, no. I'm, I'm not trying to advocate here for like you're not allowed to talk about anything <laughs> that's not what i'm trying I'm, ba- I'm basically trying to understand why the fr- why we frame everything in terms of like comparison with other things for example even now you're you're talking about like uh you know the i thought this thing was really impressive or something like that and i'm, I'm not look i'm not saying that like that's bad i'm just i'm just saying that's something worth noticing and thinking about that like a lot of this a lot of the ways in which we make sense of things is by comparing them and ranking them and sort of yeah, yeah to, to other things i don't think it needs to be comparative though i think you if you just because it tells it tells you a lot about you the person talking oh, okay to, yeah, to, yeah, to, yeah. To, 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 to express the things that you yes, liked most i'm a boy about. you're yeah i think it's fine to say i like this thing i think that's fine <laughs> <laughs> but it's fine to say i dislike this thing <laughs> <laughs> So one thing that comes to mind while, while, while we're having this discussion, so um, I'm, I'm in the process of training to be a clinical communication skills facilitator at Cambridge. Uh, and I've only got like one session left before I become fully qualified. But there's uh, one of the kind of various bits of educational theory that they espouse is that once, so the, the way it works is that um, we get students to do role plays with actors or actresses pretending to be patients. And then they come back into the group and then we as the group give them feedback on, on their performance. But the question that me as the facilitator that I would ask the student when they come back is, uh, how do you feel or how did that feel? But we're, we're not supposed to say, how did that go because how did that go is asking specifically for a value judgment whereas how did that feel is asking for their feelings which is actually what we, what we want to get at without without doing a value judgment so kind of i wonder if what we're all sort of getting at is that we want to express how we feel without necessarily kind of judging the value of an experience we've already had as being like good or bad i mean i think good is fine but like bad is the is the one that i'm i, I would be uneasy of uneasy about i just think that sounds weird outside of a communication skills session though <laughs> Okay, uh, so let's say I was, you know, I, w- I watched a YouTube video, for example, and you would ask me, how was that YouTube video? I would feel very bad, if even even if I didn't like it, to say that, oh, it wasn't very good, because I would be in a way, uh, you know, uh, crapping on the work of this other creator, you know, who I, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas I feel it would be more, if, you know, if I thought it was amazing, like, oh my God, that video from Wendover Production was was incredible, you know, just the, the detail he went into about how, you know, Air Force, Air Force One works and <laughs> all the animation and stuff was incredible etc etc that would work nicely but i would feel very uneasy saying like talking in that level of detail about something i felt negatively about but how's that any different if somebody asks you how do you feel I know what's going to happen here. We're going to come full circle and we're going to redefine good and bad in terms of, oh, when I say good, I mean, I felt good. Not that it was good. <laughs> just gonna, <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> okay, I actually don't know where I don't know where I'm going with this. I can't remember the original point I was arguing. If 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 there was a point to be made at all, I think I think there was a reasonable point of like refraining from making uh, trying to sort of make value judgments where you sort of say that this thing is you know this thing is is so is whatever, uh, and instead talking about how things make you feel. So I think in the context of holidays, this is when it comes up most often in my life, where like occasionally people will ask, oh, what's what's the best holiday you've ever been on? And I'm I'm like I've 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 had that question a few times in the last few months, and I've always felt a bit a bit like oh damn okay uh, I guess I don't know really uh, because I don't I just don't naturally think of holidays in those sort of uh, comparis com, com, yeah, yeah, yeah. comparatory kind of terms that oh that that trip to Bali was objectively more fun than our trip to Iceland or whatever. wait wait let me stop you there I think part of the issue is that most of the time people just use like these kind of like superlative things of like uh, oh yeah what's the best X you've had or whatever. It's just a conversation starter. It's just a way to like get into topic. When you know, when when Mimi asks you how, how was your meal, it really. <laughs> he, I guarantee you, she just really doesn't care much about how you know what you really actually thought about the meal. It's just like fodder for. Oh my god, you're right. <laughs> talking and connecting with someone. So I think I think we should like ignore those kinds of things in this discussion because it's just like you know it's just yeah it's, it's an entry a... point into a conversation you can't you can't ask a question of like tell me about all of the holidays you've ever been on yeah. <laughs> and it's also weird to say tell me about a random holiday you've been on <laughs> you know like okay yeah i take your point um, so let's ignore those kinds of things so uh but i think th- there is something worth exploring here because for example in in Tim Ferriss's podcasts, when he, when he talks about how he interviews people, he says that in, in, in the first few dozen episodes of his podcast, he used to ask the question, uh, what's your favorite book? And that would be a very difficult question for someone to answer. But then when he changed that question to wh- wh- what's a book that you've, uh, what's the book that you've gifted to people most often, that becomes a much, much easier question for them to answer. And I think even though really like he's basically trying to get at this practically the same thing with both questions, one of them results in a response of being like, oh, actually, uh, now now I need to sort of rank order everything and feel like I need to answer this question. And the other one is much easier to you know, do the search the search function for, mm. if that makes sense. But I, guess, I that's not quite what you're saying about, you know, how was, how was, how was the meal versus, you know, what, what's the best holiday you've been on? No, that's a completely different thing. See, you guys did an episode about this back in October, a little like small talk and social awkwardness one, where... It, and it baffled me like at the start because you guys and I'm really impressed that you guys manage on a weekly basis to put out like an hour of stream of consciousness discussion uh, and yet you spent the first like 10 minutes of this podcast you know declaring that you 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 think you need to think of or like plan a way to have a conversation it was really weird to hear you have the meta discussion that was like I'm actually really uneasy going into a conversation without a way through the conversation ah. while you just had a conversation with each other completely more or less unplanned for like an hour and then put it online that that baffled that that baffled me how those two things could be true at the same time oh that's interesting do you do the conversation thing of like planning out conversation paths in your head no but i i i look ahead in conversation because i i don't like I, I used to I used to end conversations early for fear that I was wasting people's time. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I I remember the first time you told me this. I think it was it was in like fourth or fifth year, and I was. Oh, like, it was oh earlier. My... It was earlier. It was like second year. I remember. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was way back. Because, because I remember hearing that and thinking, "Oh my god, that's exactly how I feel." And I, I had no idea that you felt that way as well. <laughs> it was it was a real like, "Oh my god" moment for me. Yeah, and yet you always said, you know, you're you're really good at like at making conversation. As in, I said it to you. You, you yeah. said it to me. <laughs> I think you're very and, good and, at making conversation. And, yeah. and I and I I, I when I went to university was like I need to get better at making conversation because otherwise people will think I'm weird nice <laughs> and the way, the way I think the way to do it is uh, uh, you, you look ahead in conversation you see like where is this conversation going yeah how can I get it away from the pause yeah you don't want a pause right yeah. so you need to predict when the pause is coming and then have a question for the pause mm. do you never do that yeah I mean yeah, yeah it, 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 it's not like planning your way through the conversation but it's not letting things get to the stage where you go so, yeah uh, there's a uh, the, there's an idea that I, th- I think I've talked about before at some point. I, I picked this up from uh, this book, uh, Char- uh, Charisma on Command, which is now a YouTube channel. Um, and he, he calls it a Velcro theory. And the idea is that that you know how Velcro attaches to it, it's, itself. It's like there's lots and lots and lots of little hooks 
So what he says is that during conversation, you want to sort of throw out lots of hooks out there, like in your answers to stuff that the other person can pick up on. And then you also want to sort of keep in mind the hooks that they've thrown out such that if you do get to the pause, you can be like, oh, you know, speaking of blah, 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 you know, tell me more about that thing that you've latched onto. Yeah, you just keep a few things in the back of your mind that come up in conversation. Mate, that's that's far too simple a way of saying this. There, there, there is a much more pretentious way. You don't need a stupid theory for this one. <laughs> but, but doesn't that, doesn't that, when does that hooks thing get into the, into the realm of just like interrogating people? I feel like if it's a balance between, uh, so I feel like in normal conversation, there are a lot of statements made. Whereas in an interrogation, there are a lot of sort of question answer. And I've found, uh, since I've started paying more attention to this, I found that in, in cases where I feel less comfortable, I do more of a question and answer sort of vibe. Whereas in cases, in, in situations like, like this one, for example, where I feel much more comfortable, it's like, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll all basically be throwing out statements with the occasional question. And actually, I had this, I had this experience ye- yesterday evening. So we, we, we had this like meetup of all the YouTubers in this, in this agency. There were like 30 people there. I'd, I'd met like two of them before, talked to, to about three of them on Slack before and just didn't know who the other 25 were. Apart from like, oh, that's CGP Grey. Oh, he's the guy behind that YouTube channel. Oh, that's, that, that's a big deal. Um, and I felt very, like, a little bit uneasy in this environment because, you know, there the, the was that big imposter syndrome thing of, like, there's all these big YouTubers and they're all, like, you know, they're all really cool and, and, and stuff. And I found myself at the start, like, sort of in sort of quest, question-asking mode where I'd be sort of asking a question and kind of, thinking, you, know, you know, intonating at the end of it, or whatever the phrase is. Um, but I, I spotted myself doing this and actively sort of did the more of, like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to act as if these guys are, like, my closest friends already and I'd just be making statements with the occasional question thrown in. And I found that this is just that strategy just made me a lot more comfortable and i feel like it made the conversations flow a little a little better as well yeah this is something i also pay a decent amount of active attention to because i think like yeah i think it's easy for something to fall into the question answer pattern and i think like it, you, know, you you kind of want there to be a balance and so uh oftentimes if it feels like i've done too many question asking and the other person hasn't really you know asked me any questions or whatever uh i will try and make some more statements or just like give my take on things like yeah I, i'm just sort of like acutely aware of sort of like the balance like, how much each person has been talking and questioning and when I need to like counterbalance do do, do a correction you know nice that sounded sufficiently pretentious (laughs) is that pretentious I don't like (laughs) I feel like uh, uh, I'm putting this thought out here man (laughs) what the hell no uh, I mean, pretentious in a good way, because I feel like a big part of this podcast is, I, th- I think one of the accusations that could be very fairly levied, ag- levied against us is that we are kind of taking things that are obvious and spending like an hour getting to this obvious insight. Yeah, um, and there have been episodes. Of yeah, <laughs> but I think that's a good thing, as opposed to kind of being a bad thing. Yeah, yeah. Journey, not the destination and all that stuff. Absolutely. Callum, how do you think we can improve the podcast? So one of our current theories is that we need to revisit some of the hits, you know, low social optionality, measure, all this kind of stuff motivations myth <laughs> we need to revisit the consistency hits. is the most important thing in life <laughs> we, uh, with uh, with sort of guests who can ha- have different points of views because yeah on most things we basically have the same opinion and that probably gets boring i mean have, have you found that ever kind of gets boring mm, the ones where you have the same opinion are are less interesting than the ones where you like have a go uh, right yeah and actually with you know like ali sort of mentioned once briefly in this episode there are often like quite interesting topics that we would like to do but it would just be stupid to do them with just mine and ali's sort of life experience slash point of view because it's basically the same and i think there are lots of interesting topics where like it really has to, the topic has to be treated with a broad range of perspectives and like two two dudes who basically have the same life experience and thoughts on things you know talking for an hour about this you know topic that lots of people have lots of different experiences about it's just kind of stupid and so yeah we kind of want to do more of that sort of thing i don't know i I, i'm not sure i can answer that without making a load of suggestions for what should go in pods oh perfect but we'll do that off the recording so that it looks like we've come up with the ideas spontaneously that's fine i'll stick them in an email hi at (laughs) notoverthinking.com if anybody else has more Um, so well um another thing i wanted to ask so we've done a couple of a a few episodes where we've discussed books we just discussed the to be disliked discuss the Wright Brothers book and we had this tweet storm discussion from Naval Ravikant did you uh, sort of feel like those three kind of like book slash tweet discussions were particularly less good than other episodes or was it was that not part of the equation 
in your mind? I don't really think so. No, they did. Oh. I, I'm, 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 I'm listening for for the discussion as much as the as much as the topic. Like, and most of the time, most of the time, the topic is either uh, you know so sort of sufficiently abstract that actually you your 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 opinions on it are what I'm taking. You know, because yeah. actually I'd never read any of the things that you were talking about, so they didn't have a particular resonance with me any more than the abstract discussions that you were having about things that aren't real if you see what i mean okay hmm. so it wasn't a uh, sort of because i think one thing that we were concerned about is will listeners regard it as negative that we're doing a book discussion because it's not like original content yeah it, felt, it feels felt to me like a bit of a cop-out kind of thing you're still taking all it is is taking your view on things that uh, you know, other people have done yeah whether that's so. their book or the lived experiences that we all have i don't think there's much of a difference there yeah and i suppose it's sort of like you recently just discovering the art of gathering yeah as being like a book that actually talks about a lot of the stuff we've talked about on the podcast yeah and we, we talked about it thinking it was original content but actually it's been studied for years sure i mean you're talking about the human condition exactly. people have been alive for as long as they've been alive like people think about the human condition yeah, all the yeah, time right, they just yeah. don't yeah. write it down quite as often that's not to say that books haven't been written you look hard enough you yeah. find something about what you've just chatted about yeah sure so th this was actually one of the things they, they've been talking about in in the talks at vidcon that we all worry so much about trying to be original but actually originality is just remixing stuff that's already been done because there's really no such thing as originality and so yeah yeah i think that's like classic advice for creators entrepreneurs everything so we should take that advice ourselves more often and not worry too much about yeah you know, using sure. using other uh, other things as a springboard for a, for a discussion yeah Callum, are there any sort of recurring patterns of thinking or analysis that you've noticed that we sort of fall into which you think are bad like how can we improve our discourse and thinking <laughs> that's a big question That's hard. I'm trying to. I'm trying to thematize a whole year's podcast in 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 live in live time. Goodness me. Um, okay, to help so, to help you. Okay, sorry, go. No, go on. I was going to say to help you out. Uh, I guess I I kind of asked you the question of what's your favorite book, and to reframe it in terms of what book have you gifted the most. I might ask, uh, for example, who out of the two. And look, I'm not doing this for comparison's sake, but who out of the two of us do you find yourself getting sort of annoyed at? more more often when you're sort of listening to the podcast or disagreeing with more and, and then we can kind of figure out why and, and um approach okay that. that's much easier so I, I i disagree with ali much more than i disagree with you okay and maybe part of that's a uh, uh, a learned behavior because i spent six years <laughs> i spent six years like disagreeing with ali yeah you've learned <laughs> that if, if he's saying it, it's probably rubbish <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I learned over time to view with a degree of skepticism whatever came out of Ali's mouth. And you and I have known each other that well for less long. So yes. I haven't yet learned to dispute everything that comes out of your mouth quite right. in the way that yeah. I've, I have with Ali. But maybe also because Ali's a bit more, I know Ali's way of thinking. I know, or I feel like I have a good idea of Ali's foundations of yes. where he thinks from. Yeah. These things like motivation is a myth and all yeah, that yeah, sort yeah. of stuff. I know the pillars on which his thinking stands and I know the bits where I disagree with them. Right, right. So when I see them pop up, I uh, go, no, 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 I see where you're going. I see where you're going with that. You've, 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 that down, you've been talking about that since 2012. <laughs> And maybe I don't. Maybe I haven't. I haven't forensic to your brain yet. I don't. I haven't uh, completely worked it out. So I don't naturally disagree with quite as much of it. Okay. Um. Uh, but but uh, I can't think off the top of my head of, of specific things that I think have to go. Right. Um. Although I'd probably recognise them if you said them to me. Hmm. Okay. Awesome. So we've actually been recording for nearly an hour now. So I think this is a good place to end it. Um. Do we have any any last? I I feel like it would be it would be nice to have a a, a a default question that we ask every guest that we have on. That would be nice, wouldn't it? What's your favorite book <laughs> that was a joke that was a joke the one that um, I was I was revisiting so I was I was walking around town with uh, with a mate of mine who I did a lot of my you know the sort of debate organising with and we were talking about how we 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 made a fantastic team um, doing the stuff that we did and, and never really worked out why and as we walked as we made this walk round we were trying to work out what it was that that made us work as a team mm. and, and we came to the conclusion that it was it was mostly because we had 
we, we had no real overlap in our skill sets, but between us, we, we fitted exactly what we had to do. And, and we, were, we had enough trust in each other that we knew we didn't have to ask what was going on. Ah. But we looked back, and this is, this, is, I mean, this is something I want to share. So uh, we, we looked back right to the very start of when we worked together, when we were kind of thrown into the deep end of having to do this on our own, when we weren't expecting to be on our own. And we, we had this, it was like the evening before the start of the competition, we were sat together and we were like, how on earth are we going to do this? We just didn't believe that, that it was that it was going to work, and it did, and, and and we were fine. And but 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 one thing he said to me then stuck with me. He said the, the the whole idea of what we were doing was that timing was really important, and we had to always understand how long things were going to things were going to take. And he said to me, he said something to me then that has stuck with me since, and that I still try and and uh, and think about whenever I'm doing, particularly when I'm at work and and, and I'm trying to work out how long things are going to be he said Callum this week when when we're talking about how long we're going to be if you say five minutes you need to mean 300 seconds nice. we're really bad at that as humans aren't we how many times have you have said oh I'll just be five minutes oh, I, God, I, yeah. I, and you could be <laughs> yeah. literally and you could be anything between two and ten minutes time yeah estimation is really hard you know people are like oh I'll be I'll be with you in five minutes yeah. but like you're a mile away you, yeah. you, you can't be here in five minutes unless you run yeah. that's yeah. actually quite fast running a running a mile in five <laughs> yeah. minutes is hard but a mile doesn't feel like that far away I can see it I, I can see I can see your I can see your flat from here mm. I'll be five minutes you won't you'll be ten at least <laughs> but it's actually it's probably five minutes from when you're like at the roundabout outside by the time you walk up get in the door speak to the concierge get to the lift get up the lift get in here there's so much time involved in getting places yeah. that that actually estimating time is really difficult and we don't put nearly enough effort into it and yet it's a question we ask other people every day how long will you be so if i if i changed one thing about everybody in the world i would i would say that to them and i would say think about how long you're actually going to be before you say five minutes yeah nice. i feel like all the asians in the audience have just been triggered heavily that's actually really good yeah i i totally agree with this philosophy next man. time you say five minutes try and mean 300 seconds yeah i love it man i'm totally on board like i i have conversations with my mom about this all the time and uh yeah i've done some twitter polls about this recently yeah i love it man and i think this as a general question of like what would you change about everyone in the world if you could like change one make it everyone in the world do like one thing differently what would it be i think that's actually a great question that we can i don't know i feel like it would be difficult for people to come up with an answer to that off the cuff callum's clearly been thinking about this for for a, for a while as in just the, the, the specific time concept Okay, I guess but, I guess a uh, easy question. I guess the same thing is like what like what what one thing like annoys you disproportionately when people do it or something. But I, I guess you'd argue that this is proportionate. Your annoyance here. Do you, do you have time for a whole other podcast? Because I can I, I can I can talk for hours on that. <laughs> I mean, what I just said is not the answer to that question. Oh, but 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 I'll maybe save that for some other time. Yeah, I think we should save that for another time. So should we end by reading a review? Um, so I'll bring up a review and Callum, you can read it in your in your wonderful voice. I don't even remember, remember what I said. What, what did I say? No, I mean, these no, he's are, these listing are at things that annoy. Oh right, I thought you were. I thought you were dissing my pronunciation of. Okay, can you can you read, read that review and tell us who it's from? And put and put on a Scottish voice. This uh, this is a review from uh, Epistrophe Two One Three. Thank you for that. Uh, the title is terrific podcast and it's five stars. That's how everything should start. They say I have been listening to this podcast since the very beginning and it's been a source of significant insight about matters that I hadn't previously considered at a phys- at a philosophical level. The podcast, for me at least, has served as a catalyst for further thinking and introspection, and it always leaves my head buzzing for a little while after listening. In which time I can digest the debate and hopefully come up with some insights of my own. My absolute favourite thing in this podcast is when Ali says something and you can hear Tamer muttering under his breath that's highly problematic <laughs> absolute gold keep up the great work what a nice review what a lovely review I think that's a good place to end this thank you very much for coming on the podcast Callum thank you for having me and we will uh, do another episode uh, we should do another episode sometime <laughs> when we come visit Edinburgh <laughs> <laughs> look forward to it I'm here till next year alright bye that's it for this week thank you for listening if you like this episode please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or on the Apple Podcasts website 
if you're not using an iPhone, there's a link in the show notes. If you've got any thoughts on this episode or any ideas for new podcast topics, we'd love to get an audio message from you with your conundrum, question, or just anything that we could discuss. Yeah, if you're up for having your voice played on the podcast and your question being the springboard for our discussion, email us an audio file mp3 or voice note to hi at notoverthinking.com. If you've got thoughts but you'd rather not have your voice played publicly, that's fine as well. Tweet or DM us at nOverthinking on Twitter, please. Thanks again for listening and we'll see you next time. Thank you.